Hi everyone, this is episode 9 of the Metaphysics of Physics podcast. I am Ashna, your host and guide through the hallowed halls of the philosophy of science. Thanks for tuning in. With this show, we are fighting for a more rational world, mostly by looking through the lens of the philosophy of science. We raise awareness of issues within the philosophy of science and present alternative and rational approaches. You can find all the episodes, transcripts and subscription options on the website at metaphysicsofphysics.com. Today we have an interview with Huan Ma, physics and mathematics researcher, objectivist and a fellow student of the philosophy of physics. Duane originally conducted this interview, but for various reasons we won't go into here, His segments had to be re-recorded by myself. The audio may be of a lower quality than normal. This is due to the fact that the interview was performed over Skype and the connection was of fairly low quality. For the most part, the audio should be of acceptable quality, but if parts are less clear, there is a transcript which may help to clarify parts of the audio which might be difficult to make out. But without further ado, here is the interview. Huanma, please introduce yourself to our audience. Well, so um, I'm Huanma, my name is Juan Manuel. Uh, I'm a Spanish physicist and um, I majored in theoretical physics and then I've spent one year doing research in the foundations of quantum mechanics. Now I'm living in London doing an MSc course in uh, quite a different thing, which is um, physics of complex systems. And I am also interested in philosophy and quantum mechanics interpretations, uh, which has been my leitmotiv ever since I got into this science world. What did you study and why? So um, in Madrid, I could have chosen math mathematics or physics so I in the end I decided to major in physics and I decided this quite early during my high school because um, the thing that most resonates with me is discovering and understanding natural phenomena I mean I love mathematics but I I felt it was too far from the real world um, than physics Uh, it it was further away so in the end I wanted something a little bit more hands-on even if I've always, I've always been inclined to the more fundamental and theoretical side. What are the right reasons to pursue an academic career in physics or other sciences? What will enable you to make it? Well, first of all, it's a quite a vocational career, so it takes a lot of dedication and interest. I don't know, this is not a job that you can forget about once you get home for example. So uh, many scientists actually spend uh, many hours at work that they would normally have to and some keep working even at home, even at night. Uh, My supervisor last year was hoping uh, for the family to go to sleep so he could keep doing research after, I don't know, past midnight. So yeah, that's, it, it takes so much dedication. It must be your passion, your job and your hobby, which is quite a thing to request for an interest in life. Yeah, it just becomes your life. Everyone that I've known that was uh, taking a PhD or, or just researching um, have really turned science into their life. It's m- many jobs in, in, in this world. You can just forget about them once you've finished. But science, particularly theoretical and fundamental sciences, you, you can sort of go to bed and then come up with something, wake up or stand up and take a note and then go back to bed. All right. What are the things you did not like in academia? Well, in the end, even if it seems to be uh, quite a free enterprise to decide what you're going to research on, um, you actually depend on other people's approval just to thrive. You you can't just do some research um, without telling your university, for example, and then publish it. 
your university must approve of your research interests, your peers must accept uh, your papers for publication, and this sometimes turns into compliance with the status quo, you know, and so some arbitrary ideas grow over time simply because it's not easy to get a voice if you disagree with the mainstream, even if you're present loads uh, of compelling evidence, if you bring a lot of information. Um, Sometimes the world of academia is quite reluctant to accept it. So this in turn compromises the quality of the science that you produce. And that's, uh, I think, an inherent thing in academia. It's been running for ever since universities were built and began being a thing in, in the scientific research world. So I don't think there's much that we can do about that. What is it they say? Publish or perish? Well, they want you to publish stuff they think will bring in the funding. Which is fair, they obviously need the funding. But less mainstream ideas might not be perceived as highly fundable ideas. What are the things you liked being in academia? I think the best thing is that you rarely meet people that aren't impassionate with their job. So everyone is pretty much up for discussion, time for me meeting of course but you, you you can just go downstairs to the cafeteria and find some coffee and some interesting talk for half an hour one hour uh, about your research interests so you can share your passion with people uh, you don't usually find this in some other jobs uh, people are usually willing to forget about their jobs once they're done but in science since it's such a vocational thing you are always finding someone, some peers, uh, ready to talk. I, I love that. And then also when you don't push reviews tolerance um, that much, you enjoy quite a lot of creative freedom and it rarely becomes monotonous because you can always jump back and forth from different research topics. Yeah, even the most irrational of them, say Max Tegmark, are very passionate. I don't like what he has to say, but he is passionate. Do you wish you had studied something different? And if so, why? Thinking back, had I known how academic research would turn out, I would probably have gone for something I can still be creative at, but something that doesn't demand some gentle form of compliance. There's also this um, Adler Shrug related dilemma. I don't know if uh, your audience is familiar with the Adler Shrug um, plot. I, I won't disclose that much. But the, this dilemma is basically that scientists get scorned and underestimated, usually poorly paid and discredited. Well, for example, pseudoscience gets more and more popular nowadays because um, people prefer being told what they want to believe rather than the blood and truth. So that plays against science and for, say, uh, religious or scientific views. So um, I think it's healthier for one's emotional well-being to pursue a career where you can get what you earn. And I sometimes think that becoming a researcher somehow mm -hmm. resembles becoming a nun. It's implicitly written in the terms of your job uh, that you will dedicate as much as it takes uh, of yourself to science, and uh, what you get, what you get from that becomes pretty much irrelevant. You basically, uh, you, you have decided to put your whole life and your all of, all of your time, all that it takes, into science, and you are pretty much signing up for a contract where your time or your spare time isn't that valuable. Uh, if, if, if you're about to publish some paper or if you're collaborating with someone, maybe you have to put 18 hours, well, that's an exaggeration, but you have to put a lot of hours a day, um, perhaps sometimes skipping meals or coming home at past 10, and um, it's just scientist life. No one will see that as a strange thing. Uh, if, if you get some other job, you might get paid for extra hours. In science, it is implicitly accepted that you will have to do some extra hours at some point, but 
you just won't get paid for that simply because you are expected to be so committed to science that you're not expected to expect something else in return. So I would have probably gone for something which is more efficient in these terms that I can get really what I'm working for, but I earn a decent amount of money to simply enjoy all the aspects of life and not just let science absorb all of my time and all of my dedication. I was, I've been about to move to um, naval engineering, which is something where I can see the results of my work in my hands. I can actually touch the results of my, of my work, which I, I don't think is necessarily worse than doing science, but I also like to see uh, where all my, my work has got to. So yeah, looking back, I, I might have chosen something of the sort. Imagine how much better it would be if people lived in a world where we had greater respect for good science and more appreciation for how hard scientists work. I think they would be better off and might make more progress. What do you think about string theory? Oh, well, uh, to paraphrase the fountainhead, I don't think of string theory. <laughs> no, really, um, I think the methodology uh, adopted by theoretical physicists in the last century inevitably leads to arbitrariness, and what's even worse, a complete disregard for understanding natural phenomena. For example, Descartes wrote uh, several volumes rationalizing answers for every single scientific problem he could find. And then he proceeded to claim that he had discovered everything, literally, he said that. But at the very least, he intended to understand the world around him. Modern physicists make the exact same guesses, only mathematically more sophisticated, but they don't care about explaining reality. All that matters to them is to create a model, they say, that predicts numbers, and the less conceptual they get, the better. This is known, actually, as the shut up and compute principle. And this is, of course, I think, a losing strategy for science. But they get their peers appraisal. Ironically, however, mathematicians, for example, uh, they know that you can always make a model sophisticated enough to account for any data. Uh, so that doesn't mean it's a good model if you can't make any sense out of it. For example, I could write down a set of equations explaining in detail uh, when and how the light inside my fridge will turn on and off as I open and close the door. Uh, have I actually learned anything about why it behaves so? I could claim that a ghost is operating the light and my equations would not be able to contradict that because all they do is predict results rather than explain facts. So... String theory does exactly the same thing, and that's why I consider that neither of those are even scientific in nature. They're more like mystical claims, epistemologically speaking. I think the ghost theory might make more sense than string theory, or at least be easier to understand. Who is your favorite figure in physics? Also, probably saying Newton would be too uninteresting, as we all know, but he was a genius. And maybe some of the audience will even be familiar with his work in the epistemological field of induction. So to be a bit more of a romantic spirit, I will say Ludwig Boltzmann. He vigorously fought for the relevancy of philosophy in scientific activity against the rising facet of his current of his time, like by Ernst Mach. So um, he was quite a hero in my view. He laid the foundation for and then developed statistical mechanics, which is is the link between microscopic and macroscopic behavior of physical systems. It is such an important core theory because, for example, uh, the, existence of, uh, the existence of atoms could be proven in this way. So this was actually the greatest feat in the 19th century, considered by many or nearly all historians of science, uh, because it's a causal explanation. Well. Then, at his time, the causal explanations were simply disregarded. So uh, the arrival of atomic theory as a proper integrated explanation of the microscopic 
Olympic phenomena was delayed because of the opposition to Boltzmann's views. But he, he defended it to the bone. But regardless of the outcome, uh, he stood against a grave philosophical danger for science. Boltzmann, he made my favorite list too, for basically the same reasons. And least favorite figures? It'd be a perfect moment to say Ernst Bach, but he wasn't even a scientist. And uh, on the other hand, Descartes was so thoroughly wrong. It's funny to read him, um, but I don't know. It, it, it's so funny, I don't really hold any real antipathy against him. So I'd say modern physicists get the worst of me. And particularly Stephen Hawking's figure has been remarkably damaging to the philosophy of science. He even claimed that philosophy was dead and science had to take over. He could get eloquently scornful with opposing views to the delight of his followers, many of which not first in science would absorb and spread this new part of his viewpoint beyond the realm of science. So I think he was particularly damaging. And um, I also think he was quite overrated. If you look through his scientific feats, I think the most important one was Hawking's radiation. Yeah, I think he, he would be my least favorite figure. Yeah, Feynman agreed on that, and so do a lot of physicists. It's, yeah, it's a pity, right? Because uh, Feynman was such a great guy. Uh, maybe he had just absorbed too much of the philosophy of his time, and he wasn't that much to blame. Ernst Mach did not make our list, but only because he was not, as you point out, a scientist. But he certainly deserves to make one of the lists. Which figures in physics and or mathematics have been the most influential, do you think? The most influential figures have been those who have made a philosophical difference. There have been great mathematicians who have pushed their fields forward enormously. Gauss, Riemann, Euler. But the mathematical feats aren't very influential. There are technical, foundational, deep, and extremely useful results. But I think being influential here is changing the way the whole subject is approached, for good or bad. And in this, Newton and Cauchy, to mention some, have been uh, really influential. They've really made a difference. Cauchy, for example, found the way of dealing with limits without ever appealing to the invalid concept of infinity. Uh, by that time, engineers would rationalize the theory of limits um, by cancelling infinities out and things like that. Cauchy found the way around this and thus laid the foundation not only for mathematical analysis but also for the modern standard of mathematical rigor. So he really made a uh, difference in the whole field of mathematics. And as for physics, and aside from, from Newton, um, I think Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr have been influential characters. Um, although they've been promoters of unreason in science, each in his own way, um, the truth is they paved the way for changing the way scientists work. You have studied a lot of physics and done some research. Did you enjoy it? What did you like about it? And what did you not like about it? I uh, much enjoyed the thrill of advancing humanity's knowledge. It seems to me um, a, quite a romantic uh, attempt. And I actually had a professor who would say, you can't get any nobler than that. Um, and it also gives you quite a lot of creative freedom. What I did not like was that I found that my epistemological standards were mostly incompatible with how I was asked to validate my work. And this, this is just not something, not something related to simply being approved by people around you. But you might not be able to do some of your work if you don't comply with those standards. And sometimes my standards were quite different. Do you get the impression that when it comes to certain parts of physics, there are a lot of floating abstractions which nobody understands? Oh, absolutely. It even propagates back 
um, so modern praxis is contaminating the teaching of classical concepts. Einstein said that you do not fully understand a physical concept unless you can describe it in such a way that your grandmother can understand it. And I think that was a good way of looking at it. But unfortunately, there's very little of this today. It was Bohr who won that debate. So now the general trend is for lecturers to focus on the mathematical development of the theory with extreme cases where you get scorned at for asking why. And I'm talking out of experience. I've, I've seen a lecturer laughing at, at, at her classmate because she asked, but why is that the case? Why does that happen? And uh, he pointed at the blackboard and he said, that's the mathematical proof, that's the why. There is no why beyond that. So, yeah, there are quite a lot of floating abstractions. For example, when I studied thermodynamics, which is a classical thermodynamics, which is a well established theory, it was established between the 17th and 19th centuries, um, I was presented it in, in an axiomatic way. Pretty much the same way as very abstract mathematics is presented and constructed today. Uh, so we try to deduce as much as we could from one axiom, and then once we couldn't uh, deduce uh, any other things, or once we come up with questions that we couldn't find an answer for within our set of axioms, we would add yet another one, and those axioms would uh, eventually be the laws of thermodynamics. That's a, a really rationalistic way of presenting the theory, and it's exactly the opposite way in which it was induced and discovered. So the, the, the very same theory which has been established one way across many centuries can be flipped up and looked at from the opposite perspective, and, and then uh, what used to be so well established suddenly becomes total floating abstraction and people really don't get the hold of the theory. So yeah, it even back propagates, as I say. I don't think too many grandmas would understand much of anything proposed today, even if they had a postdoc. That's quite true. We're going to try it. We could try. I've, I've actually tried with my grandmother, and I would like to think that some of the things she got her head around. So, if any grandma can understand string theory, she is the smartest in history. Well, you, you're quite right about that. Well, the, some of them do knitting, so you you could use that analogy, even if uh, string theorists would, would tell you to go to the physicist hell. Because you're, you're talking about a real thing like a thread. Which philosophers do you think have the greatest influence on modern physics? Huh. Theoretical physicists um, usually think philosophy has no influence on the research and the methodology. But the fact is that uh, positivism in the late um, 1800s uh, they were, it was devised by Ernst Bach, and that's at the foundation of a so-called hypothetical deductive method, which is nowadays taught as a synonym for the scientific method. Um, the, hypothet the hypothetical deductive method says um, you should first propose whatever comes to your mind and then see if evidence can back it up. The inductive method says quite the opposite thing. You decide to look into some aspect of reality and then you make experiments and then you try to integrate that with the full context of your knowledge. So it's kind of doing things backwards. But this method has been used and as I say, it's been taught as the scientific method. They don't even make any mentioned to induction or to any other way of understanding the real world, even if that's been the chief scientific method. And of course, that's what, what's brought all of the important results in the history of science. But nowadays, it's completely forgotten. So yeah, the hypothetical deductive method is um, the most influential ideological aspect of modern physics today. Yeah. 
this is uh, what detaches the model from conceptual understanding, you know, and I think that's the most dangerous problem with this method, because um, that's actually what, what, in my view, that's what lays at the core of all this trend to forget about the, the physical meaning or the implications or causal relationships in the real world and focus only on modeling and mathematical uh, analysis. Yeah, you can prove almost anything if you start with your conclusion and walk backwards from that. Isn't that what religious people try to do all the time? Uh, yeah, maybe maybe they've learned from from religious theorists. If you could do one thing to improve the state of modern physics, what would it be? Oh, I would teach philosophy. And I would teach the importance of philosophy. I think that's all there is at the heart of this whole mess. And more specifically, I would explain why induction is a valid methodology, what hypothetical you can to approach this of thought. I think if you can get that into the minds of modern wannabe scientists, then in the long run, the whole of academia and the, the world of scientific research will improve significantly. You will get, you basically get much better scientists when they know why they're doing it and why it is valid uh, that they reason in one specific way and not in some other. A lesson badly needed, given how dismissive many in the field are of philosophy. I don't think there are a lot of great inductive thinkers in the field or in any field for that matter. Other than teaching philosophy and letting it spread and gain influence over time, I can see barely nothing that can be done to improve scientific research. Most researchers are way too stubborn to change their mind now. And it is a saying among physicists that if you want a clever idea to spread out and become popular, you should first wait for the current generation of physicists to just retire or die uh, before new idea can, can really shine out. And that's actually a really sad thing, but I think it's symptomatic of this widespread problem in, in academia that some new ideas get rejected too quickly when actually science should be ready to accept uh, reasonable proposals and new viewpoints. Yeah, they better start training the next generation of physicists in philosophy. They should put it in high school suddenly first-year college classes, since it is at least as important as physics classes. Do you think modern physics can be saved? If so, how? Oh, I do think it can be saved. After all, the mathematics is well crafted. All it takes is scientists who devote more time to understanding what can already be described, instead of elaborating further in the mathematical sense. I know this may seem a utopia, but actually mathematicians do that. They recognize the value in understanding stuff as much as moving forward. So yeah, I think it is a cultural, rather subcultural thing. Physicists tend to be much less interested in this, and this is reflected in the demand for such um, advancing work, for uh, deducing new things from what's already been deduced, rather than actually giving an intuition or a better understanding of, of what's already been discovered. That does sound quite achievable, given the right cultural changes. Do you get the impression that physicists understand what mathematics is and why it is so useful? No, they don't. <laughs> no, I don't think they do. Uh, but fortunately, mathematics is too solid to be affected by their years as misconceptions or such a time. So many physicists like to say that mathematics is the language of the universe, as if natural phenomena were somehow written in the code. Quite close to one creative viewpoint, it seems to me. Um, on the other hand, I find it quite simple. We create mathematical concepts and then theorems and theories based on those concepts. Uh, 
and they are discovered as necessary implications of the definitions that we created. I may be taking a long shot here, but I think they don't realize what we create mathematical concepts because uh, uh, they have been given up in induction, so they only focus on the deductive part, which is a sad thing. I think the Republic represents a fairly accurate view of what many consider mathematics to be. What do you think about all these quests for a theory of everything? Well, I find it funny, actually. What exactly are they looking for? Is it, um, isn't it a compendium of all knowledge, by definition, an attempt at a theory of everything? Um, I don't quite get the definition they give. Do they want to unify forces and particles, as some say? How is that supposed to be a theory of everything? I mean, good luck using that theory to explain phase transition. Then why do they call it of everything? I think it's of everything they deem worthy of such a godlike theory. So um, being more realistic and also more ambitious, wouldn't something like conservation of energy be a much, much better candidate for a theory of literally everything? Uh, so I think they are lost in the quest for grandeur. Uh, you know what I mean? In, it's not, ultimately, I don't think it's about understanding the world or getting a unified description of it. It's mostly about feeling they've ascended into to a godly realm or something like that, uh, that they've crowned human knowledge. I, I think they're looking for something of a personal glory, which I think is okay, but it's just not <laughs> in finding such a, an apparent theory of everything. Human knowledge, by definition, is a theory of everything. And as we get going, it just advances forward and forward. And since everything is integrated, that is a theory of everything. Anything else is just pretense. I think they basically want to be able to describe everything in physics in a set of equations that you can print on a t-shirt. I have heard some of them say this. If you, if you want a short <laughs> equation to describe everything in physics, you could just write E dot equals zero. And I mean, that's something you can print on a t-shirt. That's not something most people will really understand. So it's not so easily in, uh, sold. But being, being honest, that's, I think that's the closest that you will ever get to a theory of everything to say that energy gets conserved over time. I think emergent properties uh, prove that no such monistic theory of everything will ever be achievable because um, at, at different levels, the very same physical objects behave or give, uh, give way to many different results. So um, you can't just encode uh, macroscopic behaviors and microscopic behaviors in, in a table of fundamental particles. So I think it's uh, any attempt at what they call a theory of everything is it's, it's not really a theory of everything. It's just a theory of everything they care about. There are, of course, other interpretations of quantum physics than the Copenhagen one. To what extent are they taken seriously? Well, uh, generally speaking, fundamental physicists can be divided into two big groups, aside from sparse exceptions. On the one hand, we have neo-positivists, who disregard anything that contains the words explanation, interpretation, physical meaning, or anything of the sort. And on the other hand, there are mystics, who enjoy pretending that science fiction is actually real. These, interestingly, only take seriously whatever is deranged and disregard any serious attempt at explaining things. Uh, they get really picky when you try to say electrons have a physically determinate position, but they are totally okay somehow with, uh, with the, the electron crossing two slits at the same time. So that's just 
going by emotion, I think, instead of considering facts, they just stick to whatever picture seems more appealing to them. I imagine if Bo was alive, he would tell us to try blend all these approaches together somehow. Tell us about some of the most troublesome trends you have encountered in your studies and or research. I've really struggled with the shut up and compute paradigm uh, because I simply cannot work like that. If I don't fully understand what I'm doing, I get blocked because my mind is unable to focus on anything other than just understanding it. I can't go on if I don't get a sense, at least a sense, of what I'm doing. And when nobody provides such conceptual explanations, I'm in serious trouble. Then, uh, on a more technical level, there's one huge mistake that pops up everywhere in physics education. Many absorb it inadvertently, but it's quite harmful. Some people implicitly think in terms of Aristotle's final causes. That is, reality acts in some way so that something else happens or remains true. For example, many people will, um, will state that the system evolves in order to reach the state of minimum energy. Uh, these will also say that electric charges move around a conductor so that the field inside is zero or that some random events will happen to compensate some others in probability. In other words, to them, the laws of the universe perhaps are written in some mathematical language in some mystical way, and that they think they're literally made by reality. Uh, sometimes they're quite literal about this, stating that the equation must hold, so this must happen. Uh, this is a Latin reversal of the cause and effect principle, uh, or premises and implications for that matter. I think that's a total misunderstanding of causality, and people who get used to think that way usually lose their ability to think causally. And many people do, let me tell you. Many people do. Yeah, my brain works that way. If I am reading something and I cannot understand it, my brain freezes and says, you are not going on until you figure out what that was all about. But sometimes I know there is not much to understand because it is not explained. So I just have to move on. Tell us about some of your better experiences in your studies and or research. Is there anything that gives you hope? Well, not to brag about it, but most of my best experiences during my studies uh, start me. <laughs> Um, I would be a rebel, which felt liberating, but it also brought up some trouble. I remember once that I was in a lab measuring the viscosity of a liquid, you know, by taking measurements on the speed of metal balls falling through a tube filled with liquid. So the equation to describe this, this um, it assumed that the ball was falling in a big pool of liquid away from the walls of the container, and it wasn't a case, of course, because it was a uh, rather fine tube. And to account for that extra effect, a correction, a correction had to be made. It was a multiplicative factor, and my lab tutors were insisting that we made a correction to the experimental data so that uh, they matched the model's prediction. Practically, this is equivalent to multiplying the model's prediction by the inverse of that factor. So why on earth would you correct the facts to feed the model instead of correcting the model to feed the facts? Well, they insisted thoroughly. Uh, at least they could have told me it was all the same and they didn't care, but they didn't. They insisted that I corrected the date and I did not. I corrected the model. I think they gave me a lower grade than I have accepted it. Uh, well, but I think it's not very hopeful if there's only one person bringing good experiences. So here's another one. So I enrolled in history of physics, which sounds like a sensible and interesting thing to do, right? Well, the lecturer hadn't realized that knowing history does not guarantee that you know philosophy as well. So she would mess up saying that Newton brought rationalism into physics, which is a horrible thing to say. I think 
she meant to say that he intended to use reason. Anyway, she once asked a loaded question, assuming that determinism in physics, which is the idea that nature acts in specific ways and never causelessly, somehow implied that there was no free will. And I was looking through the window, listening to my classmates jabbering one after the other. It was a damn horrible show. And then, amongst those incongruent rationalizations and point Mumujumbo, a girl challenged the lecturer's premise implicit in the question. So I quickly turned my head uh, to find the, the, the heroine of the moment. That was pretty much the end of it, actually. Not, nothing followed from there. But, but it was good to see that someone was able to question the premises thrown at her instead of playing logical chess with unchecked premises. This is another interesting story. I took part in a debate where a group of students antagonizing modern quantum mechanics were trying to spread out some interesting results that have been coming up in recent years. Uh, most of the audience, uh, of the audience uh, they still favored the quantum woo, but some people were impressed. And uh, a couple of years ago, a classical system was set up in a completely analogous way as that of a quantum particle in a confined region. And the results matched perfectly. So um, I think people are slowly discovering that there's so much more classical physics to quantum physics than modern physics would like to accept. So I think that's. If you want to pick up one inspiring story, I think this last one is at least it's the one that most inspires me. Actually, that is a good point. I have noticed an upsurge in an interest in applying classical ideas to quantum physics and an increased interest in alternatives to the Copenhagen interpretation. I don't know if it is just a relatively few in the field or if it may be a more significant thing than I realize, nor am I too sure what is causing it. I haven't been following it very closely at the moment, so I don't know if it is a trend still going strong. Actually, I've gotten impressed in my MSc because it's um, a, a quite a different topic from that of quantum physics. But apparently, uh, there's more than, than we thought at the beginning because uh, Markov chains and um, the probability evolution of uh, systems that are uh, determined but not fully understood or not easily easily trackable uh, because maybe they have many components uh, and so are deemed as random processes. Um, there is a lot of theory around these sort of systems that pretty much resembles or matches Schrodinger's equation and uh, wave functions. So there's a lot to be understood of uh, the probabilities in quantum physics by means of these probabilities which can describe any sort of events for, for example, the probability uh, of extinction for a particular species in an ecosystem, which is not only a classical uh, concept, but even a non-physical one, because it's about animals eating each other. So, yeah, apparently, this theory has brought up a lot of interesting ideas that um, extend the realm in which uh, Schrodinger's equation was originally conceived. I'm not sure, but maybe this has advanced uh, uh, this attempt at finding classical correspondences to quantum theory, and they've been quite successful this far. I guess it helps that a lot of physicists are cruising on philosophical inertia. They don't really care that much about philosophies that they are applying. There is no real passion or interest in the philosophies. So to some extent they can absorb a few better ideas here and there. They don't understand the philosophies they are applying though. And they will even think that the philosophy is irrelevant while they're actually using it implicitly. So that makes them even more clueless. They don't even and have, uh, they don't even know uh, there's a problem to be solved in their philosophical viewpoint. So. Which do you think is more or less rational as practiced today? Mathematics or physics? 
<laughs> this is an easy question. Um, mathematics is way, way more rational. Mathematicians keep um, a healthy sense of curiosity and they care about ideas and conceptual understanding beyond symbols. And physicists, as you just said, are much more careless about that. Uh, for example, um, a paradigmatic case of this is the infamous statement that the sum of all positive integers somehow gives it minus 1 over 12. Well, it's mostly physicists that enjoy dazzling their minds with this. Um, and that should ring a bell if you remember how they favor nonsensical interpretations in quantum mechanics just because they have mysterious. Um, but instead, a proper mathematician, and I say proper, uh, will uh, hack this confusion into pieces by stating the simple truth, which is the job of a mathematician, by the way. Um, what happens in, in this particular case is that the function which gives that value uh, minus 1 over 12, it cannot be associated with an infinite sum in that case, because uh, the infinite sum representation of the of that function is valid for arguments strictly greater than positive one, actually real numbers. And uh, the argument of the function that gives uh, minus one over 12 is negative one. So uh, the, 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 this infinite series representation doesn't actually apply to that argument. But physicists prefer not to say anything about that. They, they, they conveniently omit it, you know. Because somehow it spoils the fun, I think. They can keep the magic alive and think that somehow such a con an apparent contradiction may hold in the real world. If I remember correctly, that silly equation you mentioned originally came up in the context of string theory. Yeah, it's true. They, they, have, uh, they get this, um, this infinite matrix, you know? And uh, there's the, the integer, the positive integers at the diagonal. So they want to characterize the matrix by its trace, which is the sum of the elements in the diagonal. So they get, of course, they get the sum of all positive integers. Okay, so that was the last question in this interview. There was more to his answer, but unfortunately, the audio in that part is very difficult to make out. So it was cut out. So that brings us to the end of this episode. Thanks for your very thoughtful and interesting answers, Juanma. We cannot wait to have you back on the show in the hopefully not very distant future. Remember to check out the website and subscribe if you like our podcast or follow us on Facebook or Twitter to get the updates. You can also support us on Patreon. Any amount contributed is received with appreciation and goes towards time and resources spent on producing and promoting the show. You are welcome to send in questions about any of the things talked about in this episode or about irrational stuff in physics or the philosophy of science in general. Send them in to questions at metaphysicsofphysics.com. Thanks for listening. Please tune in for the next episode and start thinking of some questions. Until then, stay rational.